For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. Hey, welcome everybody back to the Thin Green Line podcast. Uh, we are very, very happy to bring you a special guest. This is uh, today is going to be Andriana Fregola. She's a free diver. She's over in the uh, the Hawaii area, and she's had a heck of an experience growing up around marine conservation and continuing to do that very extensively now over on the islands and other places. And without stealing her thunder, we're going to get into her background on all of that stuff. But want to mention to you guys, our numbers of listeners and viewers has absolutely skyrocketed in the last couple of months. Mm. And that's all because of you guys making this podcast um, diverse, having a concern for the thin green line of conservation worldwide, whether it's marine, whether it's inland, whether it's a uh, border control or, uh, you know, uh, domestic security or whatever the cases may be. So thank you for that. Keep spreading the word. And if you give us that five-star rating on Apple iPod podcasts, that would be really helpful because it helps spread the word and get us noticed outside of conservation circles, which we certainly want to do on the thin green line and get everybody involved with that. Andriana, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey, how are you guys doing? I'm excited. <laughs> so am I. I'm jealous yeah, we... too. <laughs> You're in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like wearing a sweater and it's like 75 degrees. <laughs> yeah, you, you could cold. you could actually be wearing a yeah, you could be actually in the mid or over on the east coast where Wayne's at New Hampshire yeah, cold. I still have snow in my uh, yard. Not in the <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> oh man. Not. Two different worlds. I'm jealous. Yeah, and, and before we dive in, Andriana, we, we got to give a big thanks to a mutual friend of ours, John Bartolo from the John Bartolo <laughs> Show. Uh, I was on his show a couple of times, and um, you know we had we had talked a lot of different things, and he said, "You got to meet her. You guys got to have her on the show. She's doing excellent stuff in conservation, and you know doing all this free diving and and doing a bunch of real cool conservation over on the marine side." So uh, I'm really grateful that he connected us and that. Uh, that you're on the show today and we've we've had a dialogue off and on trying to get these scheduled in the last couple of months just talking about know. you know your well the dive shop you're doing right now and all that's going on there and it sounds like you've got an exceptionally full plate so before we go in the wayback machine and get, and get to your start what are you what are you doing right now as far as the, the shop and stuff and, and what's going on there mm. so i work with a, <clears throat> an organization called one ocean diving so we my position is as a marine biologist and shark safety diver. So basically what we do is we bring people out to experience sharks firsthand and see them in the wild. And you get a lot of information on the tour about how to interact with sharks, like do's and don'ts type things, like busting myths that people think about sharks, things that like make them scared that actually have no factual basis at all. Mm. Um, so you get all this information on the way out, like a briefing on all of that. And then you get the chance to get in the water and actually swim with the sharks. So you get to apply stuff that you learned. And then you also get to, if you're nervous or, you know, you just want to see sharks, we get such a range of people that some people don't know how to swim at all, which is blows my mind that they're like, my first time being in the ocean is going to be this love the trust. Um, and then we'll get people that are really experienced in shark drove all over the world. So pretty cool. And then we'll talk about uh, shark conservation, different threats that sharks are facing mm. on the way back in. Um, kind of giving people tools on what they can do to be a little bit more sustainable and how they can help sharks and the ocean environment in general. So all of that kind of stuff, really, really cool stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. And something that's interesting is um, Seaspiracy, that uh, that Netflix documentary that's getting so much attention that so many of you guys, women and men included in shark research and shark conservation, uh, you know, uh, ocean to fork, if you will, you know, rather than feel yeah. the table, like we like to say hunting inland, um, that opened a lot, that opened our eyes in a lot of ways. I mean, Wayne and I have worked inland and Marine patrol and done enforcement, especially on fisheries, he on the East coast. And, and he can certainly talk about that. And I was all over the, you know, the Pacific ocean side here off the California coastline, many times a hundred miles out on the big fisheries. Um, and doing all that and the poaching involved in that and the impacts yeah. of commercial fishing and the regulations that we, that we have to kind of ebb and flow on. But um, before we get into that, take us back to when, what started all this for you growing up? What was the catalyst <laughs> to make you want to go into biology, become a diver, uh, work with sharks and yeah. just do, you know, all things Marine. It's, it's a, it's a great, great story. Yeah. So I, um, I started 
I, I'm from Miami originally, so Miami, Florida. So I was really lucky and I grew up near the ocean. So I had just a lot of experiences diving and stuff from a really young age. So I don't even know the first time I snorkeled, I was probably like four or six or something. I literally don't remember. Um, and then I started scuba diving when I was 12. So like pretty much as soon as I had the ability to, um, I learned how to do that and took the courses, do all that kind of stuff. And I would go down with my dad all the time. Um, we go to Key Largo cause it's right next to Miami. Miami's good diving too, but Key Largo is like really, really nice. Yeah. Uh, probably one of the best areas in Florida. Of the underwater and park so we there, would go yeah. there. Isn't there an underwater yeah, park? It is, most of it is protected. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of Key Largo um, is there. protected. Molasses Reef and like, yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so we would just do that a lot. And I just really always love being in the ocean, seeing, especially like animals. <clears throat> I had always been really animal obsessed from a really young age. So definitely something that I was connected to. But then I... I studied and I had been in Miami my whole life and my dad actually lived in New York for part of my upbringing. So I wanted to do something different from Miami for college. Cause I was like, Oh, I got to get out of Florida. I got to do something different. And so I went to New Jersey for undergrad, which is like the complete opposite of Miami right. as far as like climate and stuff. Um, so I went to Seton Hall university and I actually went there originally to study psychology because I always found severe mental illnesses to be really interesting. And that's kind of where I was leaning for a while. And then basically like a year into me studying, I was like, I need to go into environmental, you know, environmental studies, marine science if possible, because it's just much more of what I'm passionate about. Like I find human illnesses, like things like that really interesting, but it's not the same. Like I, I definitely like animals more than people. So I'm like, I need, <laughs> this is what I need to be doing. And we're talking like, about yeah. sharks. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that gives you any idea. <laughs> all, all of the animals, and I, especially yeah. when they're bigger than me and when they're uh, predators. I love predators. Find all that really interesting. So yeah. I switched over pretty quickly into my studies. I kept psychology as a minor just because I was like, well, I still find it interesting, and it does apply to environmental, especially when it comes to conservation, like understanding people. Um, there's a whole field of that, which is actually really fascinating mm. how to get people to change what they're doing every day based on psychology. Um, so I did that for undergrad and then I went to graduate school at university of Miami. They have a really good shark tagging program. So that's basically what I wanted to focus on. I just really wanted to work with sharks. So I was like, if I can get involved there, that would be great. And then I can just go back to Miami because I do love Miami. Um, so I got into graduate school and I was actually kind of at this moment where I was determining if I was going to go to grad school or like delay it a year to go, do an internship with one ocean diving, they offered me an internship wow. and I was like, no, don't do something unpaid. Like you should just go right into school. So I ended up going into graduate school and then working with mm. the lab, which is, um, the shark research and conservation lab. Nice. Really, really cool stuff. If you um, ever want to see any of their, they have a really great Instagram where they post a lot of really cool information too. It's really broken down. So a lot of different people can understand it. So I worked with them for about two years and worked on my master's. And then as I was getting ready to graduate, I was just emailing people that I wanted to work for and basically sending my resume out. In the day that I was emailing people out, I actually sent one to One Ocean Diving and then later in the day, one of my friends sent me a post that they made saying that they do have an opening position for a safety diver, which is like the job that I would want working there. And then right. everything just kind of fell into place. And then I moved. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so you've been doing that ever since. And when we talk about what um, you talk about one ocean diving a little bit, what drew you mm. that, what drew you to that organization and is it just exclusively shark research and shark conservation awareness? Um, is there any other, you know, spider webs they're involved in? Cause that's the first I've heard of it. And I think it's the first time Wayne's heard of it. And yes. he's certainly gonna have some questions on this, but what a great organization you're, you're working for and with, and especially now in these times when, you know, Marine, wildlife has probably never been threatened. And I, I don't think that's an understatement has never been more threatened from mm -hmm. negative impacts past what the conservation model, uh, you know, we, we, we try to promote is facing now. Yeah, no, it, it is pretty crazy. Um, and I totally agree with you. What you're saying is we're like at a pinnacle moment. We're honestly like at a point where it's, there's so much damage that has already happened that will still have repercussions for years. But I mean, that doesn't mean you can't make a difference in the future still. So totally agree on that front. 
Um, but one ocean diving, I guess what drew me to them initially is like the in water time that you have with the animals. And that's definitely like a more uncommon thing for jobs to have that much focus on what you're doing in the water. And I followed them on Instagram when I was like an undergrad, probably like two years okay. into my undergrad. So I was like already like into it. I saw a lot of the stuff that they'd be posting. And another really cool thing that I find really cool about one ocean diving is that it's a lot of women. So it is very women empowering. And a lot of the positions working in water are there's one guy right now, but mostly women. And then like the history of the position and other people doing it is mostly women. And that's something that I was always drawn to. It's cool. Which is actually funny because the lab that I worked with in Miami was also majority women. So okay. I don't know if it's like crazy shark ladies or like what it is, <laughs> but Love it. something, Love it. something along those lines. Um, so I really, really liked that aspect of it. And I just, again, like seeing them in water and like be having that much water time was something that I really wanted. And there's a lot of other things that uh, One Ocean does work with. So we'll do like beach cleanups. For now, it's kind of been like halted a little bit more because of COVID. We can't have like a large gathering of people the way that we used to be able to. Um, but beach cleanups, um, a lot of other stuff. We'll do like whale watching on the way out, but it's not like the, the focus is definitely on the sharks. And um, there was a sea turtle project that is not as um, ongoing anymore, but has been worked on in the past, but focus definitely more so on the sharks. Mm. Yeah, I just went to their Instagram page, and there are a lot of shark pictures <laughs> there, which is uh, phenomenal photos. I mean, just just gorgeous. Just I just love blue, blue water, and then a shark there. It's amazing. It's... Yeah, that's one of my favorite. So it's like in, to paint a picture for anyone that's never seen this before, mm. it's not like reef diving. You're not diving over like a shallow reef. You're in like 300 to 400 feet of water. So it's mm. like this deep, expansive blue, yeah. which is pelagic. And that's definitely mm. one of my favorite favorite like ocean ecosystems because just the animals that you encounter is it's just amazing you kind of don't know what you're going to see and you'd have this whole length of blue water underneath you and it's kind of cool to imagine what else could be there with you sounds terrifying but it's actually really beautiful yeah and as far yeah, as you can see either way right blue 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 it's just yeah yeah it's just it's all blue so it, you can't see the bottom sometimes people will be like oh yeah like we can see the bottom I'm like no it's like 400 feet away yeah <laughs> well we, we, when you talk about shark diving Wayne and I are both divers and one of the dives I did many years ago was over in Hawaii and it was a, a dedicated shark dive and we uh, did one um, out of Fiji as well and it was oh, a, you cool. know it's, it's a little late, well exciting a little nerve-wracking there's a little bit of fear factor there so there's a lot of adrenaline but it was just uh, it wasn't near as deep as your research is going obviously i think we were at about 80 feet and we were just okay, stationary cool. kind of in a circle and it was it was a magical experience i i can't even of all the diving i've done all over the caribbean and all over the world is being such an amazing sport to open up this underwater world that so few people get to see yeah um, it's this whole other ecosystem if you will you know and and to see these sharks uh just just in mass was it was overwhelming and i know for me personally i did not know the importance and the value in the marine ecosystem of what sharks play in that, in that predatory level, yeah. you know, in, in that food chain. Um, so tell us about when you guys are diving, you said three, 400 feet. So I'm assuming yeah. you guys are not doing tank dives. You're in some sort of device or, or are you and, and, and doing some really crazy, uh, crazy dives. So it's all surface. It's all free diving. So any okay. kind of stuff, we basically, the system, the way that it works, we, we have an underwater mooring that we tie up to. So it's like, an anchor that's always there, you know, it floats at the surface. Gotcha. So you can just go to the same spot. Um, sometimes we'll drift too, where we're just kind of drifting around, but a lot of times we will tie up. And so we'll tie up to the mooring and then um, we'll have lines on the side of the boat that literally like hang on the side of the boat. So people will all grab onto the lines when they get in. So people will be next to the boat and um, the safety diver will be, you know, swimming on the outside of them. And then any kind of free diving or anything you want to do, it's all breath holds. So there's no tanks involved. It's literally wow. just like snorkel, mask, fins. Okay. So um, it's really cool because then you have a nice range where you can have people that are more experienced that do like to free dive. And it's not really deep diving because the sharks do come up. Um, they are interested in the boats because there's a lot of fishing in the area. So they do come up and check out the boats. So you don't really need to, you can literally just stay at the surface and they'll be below you or at the surface, depending on how interested they feel like being that day. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you can have that range of people that are more experienced and then people that don't know how to swim at all because they can just like 
hold on to the line and like sit next to the boat and just observe them. So it's, it's pretty cool because it's an open platform. You don't really have to have any ocean experience before doing it. It's definitely better if you do, because then right. you're more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, you're not like drowning in the snorkel and stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, like people literally just have never snorkeled before. And they're like, this is my first time right now. <laughs> I'm on. Yeah. But, yeah. but the cool part about that is at least you can expose people that don't have a lot of experience. Like obviously if you're if you're doing any type of depth free diving, that's going to really limit the window of people that are capable of doing that. Um yeah. or even tank dives like we were going on. It was pretty specialized and you know, we don't free dive to the level you do uh, certainly, but uh, but a lot of people that I've recreated with outside of the law enforcement or the wildlife conservation officer circle that work in marine environments it, they don't have that experience. Um, yeah. and it's, but they'd love to go, you know, and there's just no areas over here, especially on, on, on the mainland, so to speak over here in the lower 48, that, that there's that opportunity, um, to learn what, what you guys are putting right. out there on the conservation front for sharks. So what a neat program. Yeah. And it, I, that's exactly what I think is cool about it because then you have a larger range of people that a conservation message is getting to, because it's more education and conservation based more than anything. So if anybody can come in to experience that, it makes it more impactful. You have a wider range, a wider audience, you know? So mm. I definitely agree. So do you, when you start talking to the people, do you, do you build that conservation message in when you're taking them out? Uh, I know I just uh, Googled you quick and you're like uh, t- telling people how to fend <laughs> off sharks. And I'm like, oh, we got to tell her. <laughs> she's got to share that. She's got to tell us how to fend <laughs> off sharks. And is that part of your uh, kind of a, uh, you know, everybody, hey, we're going to go down here. If a shark comes at you, this is what you do type thing. Um, yeah, um, pretty much. It um, will give. So basically, it's a briefing that talks about like what our safety protocol is. So we'll basically tell you like what we want you to do, what we don't want you to do mm-hmm. while you're in the water. And then that's just for like us. But a lot of the safety really goes into the way you should operate around sharks in general. So like, mm-hmm. like I don't know if you want to go through all of it, but it's just basically like... Um, talking about all of that safety information and then you get some information on like the shark senses. So you learn a little bit more about them. Um, and then you learn a little bit about the behaviors, like very basic. So it's definitely not like, okay, you learn all this information. You should just like jump in with sharks whenever you want, like right. by yourself. Yeah. But it's, it's more like information <laughs> on what to do if you see a shark and you're like, you know, you're snorkeling It ha- they live there. Anytime you go in the ocean, you have a chance right. of seeing a shark, you know? Absolutely. So basic information on how to, handle that situation, remain calm and all of that. Um, so that people are empowered. If they do see one by themselves, they're not going to freak out. They know, okay, I should kind of follow these steps and like do my best to align with this, to have that better interaction with them. And then the conservation usually comes in on the way back in gotcha. um, because you want to, people are like so freaked out or they're like really <laughs> excited. So if you're yeah. trying to be like, no, you should do this to like save them. They're like, I'm just trying to like get in the water and not die. And then <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, they're like, Oh, okay. That wasn't scary. <laughs> and then on the way back in, um, usually people have a better understanding of the animals are less, a little bit less scared, at least from the experience they had. So then you have a little bit more of like an open platform to talk about conservation and they're, they're more open to receive it after it yeah. right. before is a lot of information. Yeah. And no, I, that's a great two prong approach. And, uh, now, now when, when I finally make it back over to Hawaii, I want to go, mm. <laughs> I yeah, go live with you. yeah. we yeah. got to make that happen. We do. That's and Wayne as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm with yeah. You. I'm good. We're in. Wayne yeah. and I are in. We're going to make this happen. We're both divers. We've been talking about it since pre-COVID, since we started hosting these shows together. And he's on the you know East Coast. I'm in Montana now, but still a we lot of time in California. Warm. And we want to dive. Yeah. Together. <laughs> and we want to get yeah. together and go dive somewhere. And um, yeah. this this just is so cool, especially I can't speak for Wayne, but if he hasn't dove around sharks, uh, we got to do it, brother. It's, it's yeah. amazing. But before we go further into that, take us through those safety steps, please, because our mm. listeners would love to hear what do you do if you're just snorkeling in some little reef in Hawaii, you're on some Caribbean, you know, all inclusive resort and you're off a reef on one of those, uh, you know, group snorkeling adventures and you're not prepared for that. And you do encounter a shark. What do we do? So there's a lot of like just basic steps. And again, like exactly what you're saying, this isn't me telling people to just jump in the water and like do their, like purposefully try to swim the sharks alone. Um, But information when they do, you know, ever encounter one because you do have a chance every time you get in the ocean. So um, first thing you would always want to do is look at it. Like I know it sounds like silly, but literally eye contact, they really do respond to eye contact. They're, they're very sensitive to the front of your body and the back of your body. They're really intelligent. So when you give them eye contact and you look at them, you look around, make sure there's no other sharks. 
um, they do see the eye contact as, okay, you're another predator. I see you. I respect you. Kind of that level of understanding. Um, so you'd want to give them eye contact. If that's typically all you really ever need to do to deter a shark after they see that you're aware, they're like, okay, predator, going to go on my way. Um, and then other things just to make sure what you do, just like really try to avoid splashing. Um, when you're splashing a lot, you kind of show like, oh my God, I'm injured. So you don't want to be like flopping at the surface. If you can try to minimize any splashing, gotcha. um, you want to also like, if you want to extend space. So if the shark is approaching you and um, confidently still coming up to you, nice. Another thing that you can do is actually with smaller species, we always tell people to use their fins or if they have like a GoPro pole or anything, um, if they are going to keep approaching you, then you can like literally extend your leg out with that, you know, the fin, you got a, at least like a foot of plastic on the end of the fin. That's not like going to be, have them running into your body or anything. Right. Um, and that way they can even feel that space mm -hmm. extending while you are stretching out. So um, something that you can do to claim that space a little bit more and it's going to, if they bump into it, it's something harder, more, you know, plastic rather than like squishy and soft. They don't really like touch. So nice. they're going to want to turn off. Um, you want to also just like stand your ground. Obviously if the shark is like continuously like charging you or something, it's like yeah. being territorial over an area and you just want to kind of slowly back away and give them the space, mm -hmm. but you never want to like turn away, run or like run away. Then you're doing that, like chase me thing right. where you're kind of like, the way you run by your dog and then your dog chases you, it's just like an in instinct for them. Uh, but you don't want to, you're not going to outswim them. So ever. So slowly backing away is definitely better. Um, but those are just like basics. And if you ever feel uncomfortable, get out of the water, you know, it's always better to remove yourself from the situation and force it. Um, don't like try to grab them or touch them or anything like that. And then if you guys look on social media, you guys might see, because I said, use your fins, but for larger sharks, like a tiger shark, you would need to use your hand. Probably a lot of times since they're so big, if you like extend your fin, or if you just have like a GoPro pole and you're not like really locking your arm, they kind of can just like plow through it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Which is not ideal, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't like suggest people to use their hands unless like really last resort. But with the tiger shark, you'd have to redirect a little bit more with your hand if they were coming up to you in that really like literally it's going to run into you and you have to push it off kind of thing um but it's so rare for that to happen but basic tools stand your ground look them in the eyes extend your fins out if you need and then if that is a larger shark you might end up needing to use your arm but pushing down on top of the head pushing them away gotcha so very similar to inland predators like mm -hmm mountain lions or grizzly bears that we run across all over the lower 48 um not turning and giving them that that predator yeah. prey instinct that now i'm running and, and that's a target but just yeah. yeah very very similar that's really good to know and it's kind of consistent to think if we're you know now if we're in the predators of the deep versus inland it's yeah. not that different you know for people that do a lot of hiking and a lot of backpacking in areas where you have the four-legged predators um, but now they're in the ocean and it's going to be pretty much the same protocol. And hopefully when you're, if there's that panic mode that you get, cause you're getting yeah. so close to the shark for the first time, you just kind of go into some muscle memory of, okay, think of it like a lion, think of it like a bear, stand your ground back yeah. out. Yeah. That's, it's nice and consistent. That's easy to teach and easy to explain to people that have done stuff on land, as opposed to going out and seeing uh, what, what you have. Amazing. Yeah. I always tell people if they're in a situation like that and they're like freaking out, I'm always like, fake it till you make it fake confidence is still <laughs> right. confidence like at the end of the day if you're like i'm a bad you know like i'm so tough right now like say that to yourself some of my friends talk to the sharks i i don't really do that too much um i use like my eyes but yes. um sometimes or like in their head they'll just be like no yeah. and i mean sometimes like it's just like the confidence your body gives mm. off when you're in that kind of like moment so fake confidence fake it till you make it just still do it and then get out of the water and then be like oh my god that was crazy or you know experience however you need to experience it but in yeah. the moment staying calm and like having that like confidence level definitely definitely makes a difference mm. yeah i yeah. got out safe but what did i just survive yeah. <laughs> like oh now, my god now I'll, now i'll have the shakes and the panic after you know i'll have that drop yeah like, what? process what i just experienced yes um but when you talk about that, it sounds like, I mean, have you had any negative experiences that were potentially deadly? I mean, you've done so much diving with these, with these creatures and they have, you know, such a big part of, like we said, the marine ecosystem, but they're intimidating just by design. Yeah. 
you know, how they're portrayed in, you know, everything from movies to documentaries and just what they are as a species. So tell us some stories about maybe some close calls you've had and, and, or, or friends or fellow researchers that you've worked with that, uh, that might not have gone so well. So I've definitely had experiences where it's been more heated. I don't really like to talk about like negative stuff because it makes people scared of sharks. But then at the end of the day, you still have to like understand that they're why they're predators they're like there animals. are mm -hmm. it's hard because with conservation and like debunking like myths and like bringing people closer to sharks in general and people are like oh they're just like puppies and you're like they're not they're definitely wild animals they're not like a little bichon they're not gonna just like come up to you um so i definitely think understanding the respect and like understanding what they're capable of is huge and like a really big deal when it comes to working with them you can't like ever get complacent and be like oh well it's not going to the shark's always going to turn off because sometimes they don't and they're going to like come into you you're going to have to like really be a little bit more assertive with them or just get out of the water so um i would say one of the more intense experiences i've had or, um i'll give you a couple so uh, one was on big island which is um you know the island of hawaii and the Kona side, there's a lot of really cool um, deep drop-offs around Big Island in general. It gets right. deeper, a lot faster there. Mm -hmm. So when you do like pelagic safari, like going offshore, you see a lot more different species that you would see on Oahu unless you go really far out. So mm -hmm. really, really unique and special about Big Island. And uh, one dive, we did have three oceanic white tips and they were all being really competitive and assertive with each other and with us. And it was really just really cool to see the way that they they like kind of come in in your blind spots they're very fast and oceanic white tips too in general are definitely one of the more assertive species because they are a deep pelagic species mm -hmm. so they don't encounter things as much and they also don't get to eat as much so when they do encounter things and humans debris you know other fish other animals, they're more assertive because they need to determine if you're prey or not. And so right. they're a little bit more pushy on that. And they're a little bit more opportunistic. And I mean, all sharks are opportunistic, but they really try to get what they can when they can. And unfortunately, with those deeper pelagic species like oceanic white tips, blues, makos, um, a lot of their prey sources have been overfished, which we can go into that in a little bit later anyways. But sure whole different conversation but so they're already having issues like finding food so they're just they're just known as a more assertive species and that's just how they are and um so it was just we were in a group and they were really being really pushy with us and it seemed almost kind of like they were trying to corner us together which is like like pack mentality right. um but you just have to stay calm like be assertive we had a lot of people that were shark divers in the group so everybody was really comfortable or aware, comfortable enough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we were kind of like at a borderline of like, oh, maybe we should get out and give them space because they're being so dominant with each other. Um, like, like literally they're like constantly like running into our mm -hmm. fins, cameras, things like that. Um, just like coming up, coming up. And it, it wasn't, I would never say like the word aggressive. They weren't being aggressive, but they were definitely being really confident, really dominant, mm -hmm. competitive with each other. Same with us. So we were like getting ready to potentially get out of the water if they didn't kind of mellow out, but then they did. Um, so definitely a hotter moment just because they are, a, right. I like saying the word spicy. They're like a spicier <laughs> shark. Um, and that's just how they are. And we, yeah. we had the three, it actually started out really mellow. We had one come in and then another one came in and then this male came in he had like an attitude and just made everybody else really on edge. And then that right. they all kind of fed off of that, which is a huge thing. So it's like, if we're staying calm, it's okay. But if we were like freaking out and like swimming around a lot, then they're going to like feed off of that high energy too. So mm. I would not have, we, we were fine. You know, we, everything was fine. Sharks weren't trying to eat us or anything, but they were definitely being competitive and potentially asking us for space, but, but they did mellow out. And if we didn't have the group of people that we had that were confident in the water with sharks, probably would not have had other people in the water just because it is, it was like a lot to watch. They would like take turns coming in different sides and stuff, which is, Gotcha. It's pretty cool to like see their behavior like that, but definitely a little bit of a hotter moment for me, <laughs> but it, yeah. makes it, it makes it fun. Yeah. Um, and, and when you, when you talk about some of these, um, that, that species of shark, what size shark are you talking about? Like a, a really mature, um, as big as they get, let's mm, say. An oceanic white tip. I don't know off the top of my head, the actual max size. And I don't want to say that incorrectly, but I think sure. 
it's probably similar to a Galapagos, which is what we work with a lot. So I would say probably like maybe like up to 10 feet, yeah, 11 feet. They can get pretty big. The ones that we were seeing that day were probably a range of seven, six, maybe six and a half, seven to like nine feet. So the, the, the male was pretty big. Mm. Um, the two females were a little bit more, um, a little bit younger. He was older. Like you could tell, you can tell in their eyes, like how old they are too, in their skin sometimes. Really? Okay. Um, it almost looks kind of like cataracts when they get older sometimes, like they have like a little bit more of a glaze over their eyes. And I don't know if that is because it is they're older and their eyes are getting older, but they definitely have like an aged look on their face, um, Mm. which is really cool seeing those older sharks too. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing them, seeing them still vital after all those years. And what's the lifespan of that particular shark roughly if they're unimpeded Mm -hmm. by poaching or harvest or uh, anything like that? Yeah, I don't, again, I don't know that off the top of my head and I don't want to say that incorrectly, but I know that um, Galapagos and Sandbar can live up to like 40, 60 years. So yeah. I would say probably similar to that. They might live longer because they're more of a deep water, like white sharks can live up to like 70, wow. I believe ish. It's kind of hard to estimate their age because they do, you have to do it by growth and um, it is a little bit more difficult to track, but they the larger, like more pelagic species sometimes will live longer. And then there's sharks like the Greenland shark. If you guys have ever heard of this lives in like deep cold water and they, um, they literally live over 400 years old, which is insane. That's definitely not common, but it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy to fathom a 400 year old creature. That's, that's thriving in our ocean. You know, (laughs) that's just, it's like been around since like the Renaissance, just like existing wild yeah yeah like what are you doing to the oceans you terrible humans yeah. <laughs> feel the impacts exactly and you know that there's you made a really good point the differentiation between confusing and being fearful of shark attacks versus just animated spicy behaviors you like to say <laughs> um, and yeah. i noticed that on on our shark dives um when the feeding frenzy started the bigger sharks were more competitive and uh you know they were schooling up pretty pretty aggressively. They never did anything overtly aggressive or, or harmful to us, but it was, it was pretty close when that was coming in. And um, that could be confused for they're ramping up to maybe do something harmful, you know? Yeah. Um, and that certainly wasn't the case, but, and I think, man, Wayne, I, th- I think you and I talked about this a long time ago when we started the podcast, just talking about these misnomers of like a shark attack, let's say, or a mountain lion attack inland, the odds of getting struck by lightning, you Mm -hmm. know, statistically are much higher than actually getting, getting attacked by a mountain lion or a grizzly bear in most States. Right. Right. And I hear that for sharks as well. And I I don't know what the percentages are, but shark attacks do happen obviously. And they happen with certain species and certain conditions. And we even get them, you know, here off the Santa Cruz coastline um, with the big boys coming in, but it's very, very rare overall. And a lot of people won't go out and really learn or expose themselves to this creature and everything that's within that food chain from a a conservation standpoint, because of the fear of the water. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. What do you get when people come in to do these tours and they don't have that biological background and you start giving them real statistics? Does it help? Uh, Is there still just that emotional fear to to what's really unlikely to happen, but there's still that fear or, or how does that play? I think people um, are typically really surprised. Um, One statistic that we'll give out is that, you know, the earth is approximately 7.7 billion people on earth. And there's only about 10 people out of that 7.7 billion that will actually die from a shark attack every year. And that's a death. So it's a little bit higher for like to be attacked, but it's still, still so rare. Like if you're scared, that's how you're going to die. You're way more likely to die driving in your car I hate driving in my car. Like all my friends know I hate driving. So I'm like, I'm going to die in this car. Um, I want to get with the it, instead. Yeah. I'm like, please, uh, the boat rides more dangerous. Like literally just like eating fatty foods and like getting <laughs> cholesterol, dying from like high cholesterol, stuff like that. Like problems when it comes to um, heart attacks, literally like coconuts falling in your head and killing you, shaking a vending machine, <laughs> having the vending machine fall on top of you and kill you is statistically more likely to happen than being killed by a shark. Uh. So um, people do typically respond pretty well. Sometimes people are still like, mm, okay, that's nice. But what if I'm like one of the 10, <laughs> but it's most, most of the time they're like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not so lucky. And I'm like, okay. Um, and it's something that you just have to, I think, accept whenever you go in the ocean in general, it is, 
unlikely to, you're way more likely to drown or a blackout or, you know, hit yourself on the reef surfing than you are to have a shark kill you. But it, it's something that is a factor that could happen. So I think just like making peace with that when you are going in the ocean and understanding how unlikely it is, is like really big whenever you do any kind of ocean activity. Right. And animal behavior, regardless of what yeah. it is. And it's got to be really interesting from your viewpoint with your background in psychology, because you're, you're kind of doing the shrink job on the shark and the people too. So <laughs> you're, you're, you're yes. like combining <laughs> that. And from, from that perspective, I'm like, boy, she must find this job really awesome because hey, she's shrinking the sharks yeah. and she's shrinking the people at the same time and, and dealing with their anxieties and putting them at ease. And yep. at the same time, you probably read these animals so much better because of that background you've learned. And like John and I have dealt with a lot of wild animals. We, we know when it's game time. We know when that ear lays back. Oh, oh, that, that game time's changing right now. Uh, so someone's I, yeah, having yeah. a different feeling about this now. Yeah, it, it, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it, it's it's pretty interesting, and I I gotta believe that's gotta be a lot of fun for you, and very interesting. So yeah. I, that that's that's pretty cool that you can put those two together, and then with your training, put them at ease and, and put that, you know, conservation message in there so that they're, they're accepted. And hopefully, you know, like your timing, you say, you don't, you don't want to talk to them going out there. They're all, they got anxiety. They want to talk about this and going back. That's, that's when we would do that message. That was, that's when we talk about yeah. that because that's when it's going to absorb in their head and they're going to take that home with them. That they're not going to remember anything you said about conservation going out. Cause they're all, yeah. So. Before they're just like just trying mm, to yeah. get it over with or like <laughs> yeah, right. if they're excited. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely what you're saying about like understanding people is such a big part of what we do because when we do our training, we literally go through understanding what the people are gonna do and then you focus on the sharks because yep. I don't even know. I think the people is more frustrating. I would never I would so much rather just deal with the sharks <laughs> than having the people like being crazy because sometimes people don't listen, they think they're like super confident or like you can tell when people are coming up to the boat, you're like, you might be a problem. Like just like by the way that they approach yeah. you, things yeah. that are said. I'm like, oh god. And then sometimes, go. you, yeah, you just get people. <laughs> it's just such a interesting range. And again, I'd rather people be nervous than be overconfident. A hundred percent mm. of the time, when you're overconfident, that's when things can happen because you're like too complacent. You don't respect the animal, which is right. a huge part of working with predators you need to know when to remove yourself and there's times where like i've kicked people out of the water because it's like getting really heated we've had times where there's like a bait ball like so cool when they hunt but it's like you can't have people in the middle of that because then the bait ball likes to hide under the people and then the sharks are obviously trying to get <laughs> the fish and you don't want right. the bait ball that the sharks want to eat on top of the people you're supposed to be like safetying. Mm. Um, so there's like, you know, sometimes like that, or you just have to get people out for a second and yeah, people not understanding that it's this level of, okay, we don't want you to be scared, but we also want you to respect the animals. And yeah, the, the psychological part behind all of that is really interesting. Mm. So you're definitely using your degree or your, your minor at least. So. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely incorporating all of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, every time I think of sharks, I just, those images of the shark fin soup just turn my stomach inside out. And that's whenever I, now, every time I see a shark program or anything, or I see a shark, I'm thinking shark fin soup. And how can we stop that? How can we retrain so many people to, to, to change that? Because that, uh, well, you know, talk about an impact. I saw uh, you know, just bales and bales of, of, of shark fins. And that represents, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a huge mass of sharks. And I just, uh, and when I wrap my head around the, the images you see with all those shark fins, and then you just put one shark with everything, and you're talking just masses. So uh, do, yeah. you, do you have any problems in Hawaii? I know we just, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife just did a, a shark fin bust on the East Coast not too long ago. Uh, I forget what they named yeah. the operation. But, yeah, so... You want to talk about that because, you know, as far as, you know, law enforcement goes and, and trying to curb that as a society. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we really got to do is we got to get into societies and start breaking that down and showing those people that eat that what they're doing. Yeah, um, it is. It's such a difficult subject because it is culturally from mm. Asia, yes. but now a lot of other countries will serve it in their own countries, will export it overseas. Uh, the United States, I believe, last time I looked this up was like a few months ago. So I don't know if it's changed from then, but we're like the 13th exporter of shark products. So we're not top 10, but we're still pretty high up there. 
um, contributing to that. And I'm from Florida originally. There's literally black tip shark in Publix, like in the grocery store. Right. So yeah. it's definitely prevalent. Um, but it is difficult because it is, there's an issue where people are like, oh, it's happening in China. It's like all the Chinese. And you're like, ah, let's like look at this globally. It's really right. big problem all over the place. And even though the demand for it is not large in the United States, we're definitely contributing and making a lot of money off of it. So it's, I mean, I think that's just as bad personally than you're making money off of it. You're not even, it, it means nothing to you and you're just making money off of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is definitely a delicate issue when explaining that to people because a lot of people like to bla place blame on other cultures when it is become a really big global issue. But at the end of the day, it's just something that's super unsustainable. And, mm. you know, back when it was originally, you know, created and, you know, thought of as that cultural mm -hmm. um, status symbol, it was a lot harder to catch a shark and defend it. It's like more of like showing your strength, you know, versus now it's just like long line fishing and they're just chopping it off and then throwing the bodies back or mm -hmm. bringing the bodies back, cutting their fins off. It is, I believe, Georgia, it's still legal to technically finning. So this is like good to understand for conservation too, in general. Finning is when you're at sea and you cut the fins off the shark and then throw the shark, the body back when you're only taking the fins, mm -hmm. but shark fishing, you can catch the shark, bring it back to land, cut the fins off on land and still sell the fins. So that's legal in certain States. I don't know the whole list of all of them. Right. Georgia's the number one hub um, in the United States. I believe it's like 18,000 pounds of shark fin exported from Georgia um, a year. So mm -hmm. it's a lot. And um, Florida, we just passed a bill like seven, eight months ago, maybe to ban exporting shark fins. So it just, just happened for Florida. And there's a whole, so it's so interesting. This is like a side note, but it just made me think of it talking about Florida, how different sharks are viewed in Florida versus Hawaii. There's technically in Hawaii, you can still kill sharks. Like it's fine. You can literally just go out and shoot a shark in the head. There's no law that like protects them um, in state waters. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But in Florida, there's a lot more prevalence and stuff like that. And it's actually been kind of blowing up on social media recently more because there are certain people that have been posting a lot of stuff, like literally just catching sharks and shooting them. And then sometimes eating the meat, sometimes not um, just because they're like, Oh, it's predator control. Like, why are you protecting predators? And like, right. Whole <coughs> makes me very angry. Right. And complete um, misconception. And now we're, uh, like we're not doing anything for the species on concert. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's become really prevalent. But in Hawaii, there is more of a cultural significance of sharks just deep in the culture rooted in on the islands. So it's something that's a def definitely unique perspective from the way that Florida views sharks, which would be nice if more people had that viewpoint and did respect mm -hmm. them more. But then again, it's still legal here to shoot them or like just kill them because you want to. So it's kind of like this weird, like it's not matching up. You know, you'd mm -hmm. think that if it was culturally a deeper um, thing for local people that they would want more protection for these animals, but there isn't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it blows my mind because with Wayne and I both being conservation officers and having long careers in Marine and inland, how little I really knew about kind of the Marine, you know, food chain until we started to really research to get ready for this interview with you of somebody specifically working with sharks uh, on the, on the Marine side. So um, the public, I don't think, realizes that if you keep harvesting these, you know, kind yeah. of apex, you know, predators, so to speak, of the deep, how that impacts the next level of food chain and the fishery that everybody's thriving on to the point where, um, you know, we, we talk about, well, there's been many documentaries on it and there's science on it and there's shows, but being kind of, um, you know, short term memory generally as our as, yeah. as our, our viewers are we we i talked to you early on before the show on the sea spiracy documentary yeah. that so many people in your world my world wayne's world collective worlds are really harping on on the marine side and that that documentary really got into explaining exactly how impactful it is when you poach you harvest you uh overfish whatever it mm -hmm. is on, on on the fishery for sharks um talk a little bit about that and why it's so important that we we look at these we look at these creatures as something completely different than a food source or from a predatory nuisance that we just have to take out of the water because we might get hurt, which is so horrible with what these, yeah. these animals do so well for, for the marine ecosystem. Yeah, there, I mean, if you're looking at sharks as that, you know, top predator, exactly what you're saying, they're regulating everything from what's called top down control. 
So mm-hmm. if you remove that animal at the top that's regulating everything, you start to have this whole cascade down where everything else is affected. So um, Seaspiracy explained this really well too for the people that have um, don't never seen this before, but basically you have the top predator balancing out the meso predators and then the meso predators are balancing out, you know, the herbivores, grazers, things like that. And then that goes all the way down to like algae levels and like um, coral and things like that. So um, if you're taking out that top level of predators, for whatever reason, if you just want to make money off of it, you think that one of the huge misconceptions is that if you're taking out sharks, you're going to have a higher fish population to fish because the sharks aren't eating the fish, which is actually the opposite because if they're not going after the sharks are, you know, they're opportunistic. They don't want to spend a lot of energy. They want to go after Mm. animals that are injured or dying or diseased. So because they're really only hunting ones that shouldn't be, reproducing and continuing in the population and ridding the ocean of disease, ridding that fish population of things that that shouldn't be genetically passed on. It makes that fish stock a lot healthier. So rather than taking out all the sharks and then you have all these other fish that are producing and like reproducing and creating more disease within the population, it eventually will die off anyways. Um, But even more talking about the cascade. So you have the sharks at the top balancing, eating those meso predators. But if you don't have enough sharks, then the meso predators are going to get out of population. So you're going to have this right. huge population of these other predators that are just lower scale than sharks. And they're going to eat all the herbivores and grazers that are, you know, cleaning the reef off and making sure that algae isn't overgrowing on coral and smothering the coral. Mm. And then you're at that point, And then you have tons of algae growing because there's no herbivores to eat, you know, the algae off the reef. And then it, creates like, you know, really big issues when it comes, this is obviously just focused on a coral reef ecosystem. It's very different depending on whatever you're looking at, but it's still, it's really applicable. And then if you want to talk about coral reefs are huge when it comes to absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they're really important for shoreline buffering for coastal communities. When there's storms, they protect um, those areas. And they're also, you know, nurseries for these fish that people like to eat. So if you don't have a coral reef, there's all these other issues that really start to have you know cascade down and you just have all these problems and it's so crazy how connected it is and how people just think you can remove one piece of it and not think there's going to be huge implications for it afterwards as well it's balance that's, yeah that's good my story went good no it's so totally balanced and that's what you know our biologists try to do and that's why we have limits and things like that i will say it's definitely getting better it's getting the reach i remember being a young man going out you know hook and lining uh on these uh vessels that we used to catch cod and stuff and the dogfish they would just kill them and throw them back so i guess i'd rather have them yeah. use them than just kill them and throw them back and again you would uh, we watched yeah. the dogfish get fish 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 and now we had to set limits now we had to do this and we starting to see that population drop again and, and it's just one of those things that used to be a nuisance when i was a kid now it became something product and now we're watching those stocks go down so there's limits and this and that and you're right it's that yeah. whole balance and i i think we're paying a whole lot more attention uh 20 years later in the ocean than we did before uh to shutting you know on the east coast cod's a huge thing the gulf of maine and shutting those cod down so we can try to build up those stocks again so we can start uh uh, fishing because again when i was a young man i mean we would pull 60 pound cod out that was that wasn't uncommon now if you can find a 30 pound cod you're lucky so it's just, you know, Crazy. that overfishing pressure. Um, yeah. And that was my first experience as a young man watching blue sharks out there on the, the open water and so wicked cute. cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy that shark week, I park myself in front of the TV and I learn all about sharks because it's something like this is where I need to be. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, uh, you know, if I wasn't in the mountains, I'd be on the ocean and it's, it's at least in new England, you can get there in a couple hours. Uh, not like anywhere you are. I'm, like I said, I'm so jealous. Uh, try to get to the Caribbean <laughs> yeah, once like a year. Great. But <laughs> I should have followed my yeah, heart. It's so cool. You still have sharks out there. You've got, yes. like I said, the blues and makos and all Makos that. Really cool. and threshers. And yeah, so it's, 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 it's definitely, uh, but uh, cold though. I mean, to go swimming with them, it's cold. Definitely <laughs> cold water. <laughs> well, that's another thing too, what you were saying about um, how now the stocks are depleting when you talk about sharks and some other like, you know, larger fish, they don't reproduce especially for sharks they don't reproduce quickly Mm. so sometimes they don't you know they don't pup or lay eggs every year it's like every other year some sharks Mm. like pregnancy is over a year long so they're gestating you know and growing the babies for like 16 months 
and then not all of them will survive when they do pup. So it's pretty crazy how it just, if you are overfishing them, they don't really have a chance to rebound from that kind of right. stuff because they can't physically keep up with that type of reproduction and that right. rate. Mm -hmm. And we're just learning about their breeding cycles, where they breed great whites. I know we're tagging them, tracking them now. We never did that before. Uh, tiger sharks, the same thing. We're tagging them. We're finding, you know, more and more information about them. So I, I, we're just starting. Uh, that's, that's what blows yeah. my mind. We can go to the moon, but we haven't figured out our sharks yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, you know, technically we know more about space than the ocean. So yeah. <laughs> which is crazy. And then there's this whole misconception, something else that you said reminded me of this, how you were saying that it used to be really common to catch, you know, a 60 pound cod and mm -hmm. now it's like 30 yeah. pound. You're lucky. It, there's this whole misconception too, that the ocean is just like endless and that we can just take out right. as much and it's just going to keep reproducing, keep, which is a huge, huge yes. issue for conservation in general. Mm -hmm. um, ocean conservation in general, I mean, because people don't see it. It's like below the surface. It's offshore. People aren't out there. It'd be very different if you're like running through a forest, like in someone's backyard and like doing this kind of stuff, like trawling and different fishing methods that are so destructive and you can mm. actually see it. And it's like, now you're seeing, Oh, okay. We're actually seeing that the numbers have drastically declined. Mm -hmm. And if we don't change things, they're just not going to exist anymore. So it's pretty crazy how that, that disconnect when it comes to ocean science and ocean conservation, it just, it's so problematic for actually creating, you know, fixing problems. Yes, Ab absolutely. And that's, that's well said, Andriana, especially, um, <laughs> I think about the stat that came out in Seaspiracy when, when I watched it earlier this week, that by yeah. 2049, at the going rate of right now of how we're commercial fishing and the, the massive depletion of imbalance of what we're doing with our fishery for all species, yeah, you know, sharks just being at the kind of the tip of the 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 iceberg, so to speak. Um, by 2049, the ocean is going to be almost empty. Is, yeah, is that and and that seemed a pretty drastic statement and a pretty drastic statistic, but the science and the math adds up to that, and that's not far off. That's in our lifetime, and you know, for those yeah. of us that have kids or grandkids or nieces, nephews, can you imagine going to any ocean anywhere on the globe and not seeing a fish? I, it's just as unfathomable, as amazing as, as, as that. Yeah, that marine environment's been for all three of us in the conversation today, how much it's it, we've, we've been rewarded by it. So if that doesn't wake people up, I don't know what will. Um, when you look at how soon that is in our, in our future, especially how vast the ocean is and what we're known to have so many species in it, but to completely empty it in yeah. 20 plus years, that's unfathomable. And just, no, just mind -blowing. it's just, it, and then people just don't think it's going to happen because they're like, oh, it's fine. There's plenty of fish. Cause they still yeah. see, like, I've had issues where I've had arg arguments <laughs> with people where <laughs> they're like, um, oh, well there's like an endangered species, for example, like Goliath grouper in Florida in certain areas, um, they mm -hmm. are critically endangered. Mm -hmm. I believe critically endangered, double check that. But, um, then people will say like in certain areas, they aggregate for mating. So there's like a lot of them at that time of year and they're like they're everywhere they're a nuisance they're like taking everything out they're eating all of our other fish and it's just like well of course when they're mating and they're all together it looks like there's a lot of them right but it's like that's all there is and that's that's all they got and then when they disperse it's very very small compared to the population that used to exist and what was healthy right. um so definitely I don't know, it's all really crazy and there's even estimates that say by the same year like 2048 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So like, just like right. even more debris. And I know Seaspiracy talked about that too, about how it's not even, and it's such a good point that a lot of the plastic in the ocean, the majority of it is actually from fishing and it's just like leftover materials from fishing. So mm -hmm. it, it's not even, consumer plastic is huge and it is creating a lot of pollution. But if you want to look at what is majorly polluting the ocean with plastic, right. it is the fishing industry. Yeah. And that was, that was a real eye opener because over here on the West coast, like Washington and California, we're banning plastic straws and we're trying to do all these like little yeah. efforts that are such a hindrance. And then the percentages that, that, that documentary pointed out was that is a one, one hundredth of a percent of the plastics yeah. that are ever going to be in our ocean. And it was eye opening after working commercial fishing for so long. And Wayne did a ton on the East coast is we, you know, big gillnet, big trawlers, big buoys, all of those systems, yeah. we would check from an enforcement standpoint to make sure they weren't in marine protected areas. They were using the right equipment. The nets were of the right size. I never thought about those things deteriorating and ending up on the ocean bottom and they're all polymer. 
And what they were doing to reefs, as as you know, Seaspiracy pointed out, you just hit it on the head. Is uh, what is it? Seventy, eighty percent of those plastics, like you just said, worldwide are from the fishing industry. So it's not only that we're overfishing; it's that we're not using we're not using the right materials that are truly biodegradable or that don't get left in the ocean and just decimate the bottom of a coral reef. So it's a two pronged approach um, that a lot of people aren't going to be aware of even some of us, you know, in the enforcement realm. So it's a real eye opener and tell, you know, if there's any one thing you could tell our listeners and viewers from your experience of everything you've experienced out there with the shark work, the stuff you're doing with, um, with your organization, what do people need to know? I mean, just, and remember and, and not forget after they see this interview or they go (laughs) on their next Hawaii trip and they want to go snorkel for the first time and see some great Marine, Marine life. That's such a difficult, like picking one thing is so hard. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be one. Lay it out. <laughs> I'm just going to be here another hour. Right. Um, I do two. think that understanding the urgency of the issue is probably the biggest thing is understanding that this is a now problem and it's like a past now problem that we mm-hmm. are for certain things. It's like technically, scientifically, we are past a point for like the amount of carbon dioxide we've admitted into the um, environment, like certain things like that won't be fully absorbed ever, um, at this tipping point level. And it's, it needs, changes need to happen rapidly. The way that people think about consuming and producing, it just, it really needs to change. And, um, in Seaspiracy, I know we've like referenced this a lot, but it is, I, I just watched it yesterday and it, it's really good because it does talk about a lot of issues. And I know a lot of, there's been conservationists that have like nitpicked and had like issues with certain aspects of it. Mm -hmm. which any documentary you're going to have issues with it. But um, one thing that they didn't specifically say in the documentary that I think is like important for people to understand is that when it comes to seafood, you know, there are a lot of people that do heavily rely on fish and those are those smaller artisanal fisheries. And that's very different than going out and having, you know, a huge tuna sushi, like date, you know, like boatload of tuna um, for your sushi. And I mean, I think consuming fish, if that's like your personal decision, that's what you want to do. Just, you have to be really aware of what you're doing. So right. if we have the, the, the luxury of being able to minimize the seafood that we consume as a more, um, you know, industrialized country and like just countries that do have that as an opportunity, you're in a place where you have plant-based alternatives. Um, I do think that's different in understanding that versus being like, Oh, you know, those smaller communities, they're eating all the fish, not the same. Um, so if you have the the ability and the comfort to do that, I think it is definitely a wise choice because like I guess we're at a point where it is a tipping point and making those decisions and changing those behaviors, it's really necessary now. So, and, and it sounds when it comes to like diet too, like that's one of the biggest things that you can do to impact the environment, like quickly, instead of like reducing plastic is really good, but it is difficult to eliminate it entirely. But if you're going to, you know, if you just want to cut dry something in your diet, that definitely you have a really quick impact compared to slowly removing things. Um, but yeah, I know I'm like going on a tangent, but that's just like all really <laughs> no, important to me. Stuff, and I think yeah. it's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's really interesting. And then if you want to talk about sharks in general too, like understanding the urgency for them as well, basically all the environmental issues and like now is the time. I think that's my main message is just, we need to make changes and there needs to be law to actually force those changes because some people just don't understand the level of how serious it is. And I think creating that legislation to help protect those resources is like, is very important to have in now yeah. would be yeah something that I would definitely want people to be aware of. Yeah. That's all well said. And it, it sparks another thought on this end in that, you know, some of these, we got to look at international protection laws. Um, and mm-hmm. it's something that we in, in the U S um, you know, Wayne and I have both worked with, uh, um, international, uh, our crime stoppers groups. And now in the last eight years, every state agency conservation agency in the U S has to have a wildlife trafficking unit dedicated to that. And, and that involves things like, you know, prohibited marine parts coming over, whether it be, you know, anything from sharks and you get into the mammals, uh, like Africa and the ivory trade and all of that stuff. But, what I got out of that documentary as a refresher was there's international issues. And certainly if we regulate within the U S of, you know, moderate, moderate our fish consumption, 
right? Meter it out. Um, understand that it's it it's not endless. It's not sustainable. And I like how they use the term sustainable when nothing was really sustainable. Oh God, it was that so was so well spot done. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but to do something nationally and not uh, and go beyond that and have an international impact is what I what we think it's going to take, um, especially. Yeah. Fisheries, given where the hot button areas are, we're not going to point fingers right now. I mean, we could talk about that for three more hours, yeah. you know, as, as you said, but I know exactly where you're coming from on that. And that's the thing. And we have to look at it, I think, internationally, and then certainly do what we can and, and everybody own their own and do their small part. And it's not say don't eat fish entirely or, you know, yeah. don't take out, cons you know, consuming, but just understand the balance of it. And now we have a better buffer when you see it visually of what, a big sushi night is, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You learn a little bit more about the impact that it has. Sure and do. Maybe mm -hmm. order one less plate if you're going out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and I think attacking it in a different way. I know that this media groups out there showing the impact, uh, just like we were talking about, but there's other ones out there that are taking some, that some of that money that might've gone for enforcement and saying, Hey, let's, let's try to get the, the culture. Let's show the culture what's happening out there and maybe curve the culture a little. And I've seen some of those, and they are very dynamic, When, uh, at least to me. And I don't know what, it, being from another culture, when you see that, when you see what shark fin soup is doing uh, to, to, to affect your environment and the sustainability as a young person in those cultures, mm -hmm. uh, trying to change yeah. at that base and trying to sway their thoughts at, at this point so that we can try to sway that culture. So that's... It's just different I, ways. I of think it's definitely, yeah, that's such a like difficult, there's like this whole issue when it comes to, at least like for my viewpoint, when it comes to stuff like that, because then you're it's like this like white Western savior complex thing. And it's like, right. we have to be so careful about the way we approach things like that, because then you right. come in and you're like, oh, we're the, we're the white Americans and we're <laughs> telling you the way this should right. be. And we've never done anything wrong for the environment. Right. You, no. how, and how bad, how bad you are, but we're great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I totally, I, but I agree with that. It's kind of, I mean, it's totally different, but like, imagine if someone came in here and was like, okay, no more Turkey Thanksgiving, not a thing. Right. You know, like, I know it's different. It's yeah. so difficult because then you're like, I want, I would never understand the cultural significance of shark fin mm -hmm. soup because it's not in my culture, Right. but it is so unsustainable. And there are a lot of people that are catching on to learning about that and i know a lot of younger people there have been more statements of like younger more famous people in uh, asia that are promoting that like oh we're getting married but we're not serving shark fin soup and being mm -hmm. very you know transparent about that and communicating it so i definitely think education on that is really important and then you even talk about uh, we haven't even talked about this about how it's really toxic so when you're eating shark you're eating mm. tons of mercury and lead that like accumulate in their tissue that never right. is going to break down in your body. So if you and can the older they it, are, the worse it is. Yeah. Yeah. You actually can develop Alzheimer's and ALS from that high mm. toxicity. So that's like a whole nother thing that if you yes. don't want to eat it for your health. So there's been like approaches on that as well. Just like talking about how it's really not even good for like the people mm. consuming it. Mm -hmm. um, no but doubt. yeah, I mean, I think all of that's really interesting and it's, it's definitely not an easy issue to tackle because of, no, you're the right. cultural root of all of that. And I, I definitely, it's definitely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Nope. Great point. Great point. And, <laughs> and you, you said it best when you said the tipping point is now, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, we, we, we've spent our whole careers on, on the, on this side of the world, uh, you know, trying to keep this balanced and safe and fair and not overtaken or poached. And, uh, these mm. figures that I just got familiar with getting, you know, as we were all getting ready to talk to you with this, with this documentary, just it's mind blowing. And yeah. we love wildlife. You know, you love, you, you love what you're doing on the wildlife front Marine. We love Marine and inland. I mean, we're just, and we're conservationists. We're both hunters. Mm. We're both anglers, but we're all about the balance and putting it back right. and not only sustaining, but getting those species to thrive with, uh, you know, not only, um, being overtaken by poaching, but development and loss of open space and waterway destruction and everything else that yeah. the ocean is just getting that on steroids. That's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. All the things we, in, all the things we see in streams and rivers and big tracts of open space land that are, uh, that are four-legged mammals are suffering from, uh, of, of just losing populations left and right. It's just exponentially worse on the, on the ocean front now. And it's critical that people know that. So Appreciate you bringing that to light and yeah. sharing some of what you're doing and seeing it firsthand. But um, 
for our viewers and listeners, how can people find you specifically? Is there anything you want them to know as far as how to get more uh, knowledge in this area, um, work with your group, yeah. go on a shark tour, any of the above? This is a moment we can, uh, we can network you. Cool. Um, yeah. So my personal, um, I, I'm really active on social media. I try to post a lot of educational stuff. So, nice. um, and just like more into what I do daily and things like that. So if you're interested in following along with that kind of information and just learning more about sharks and ocean science in general, um, and specifically like working with sharks, uh, my Instagram handle is Andriana, A-N-D-R-I-A-N-A underscore Marine, M-A-R-I-N-E. Um, and I also post a lot of stuff on TikTok too. I know TikTok's become a lot more like popular, um, especially for a younger audience. So I post yep. a lot of educational, more um, video style, obviously, because TikTok is videos. Um, same handle for that. I also do have a side business where I make um, jewelry from fishing line that I cut off. My, me and my oh, friends, nice. uh, my coworkers will cut off the sharks. Sweet. Um, and that is Mono Sweet. Wahine. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Instagram it. for that is M-A-N-O. Dot, I can send all of this to you too. W H H I N E. That basically translates to shark woman in from Hawaiian <laughs> to English. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's like a little side thing that I do. And then One Ocean Diving, the Instagram for that is great. If you ever want to join on a tour, um, One Ocean Diving, I would always recommend. Obviously, I love doing it. So mm. um, if you're ever interested, you can also request me as a safety diver. You can always put in your notes that you request Andy if you heard this and you're like, I want to do that with her. Nice. That's um, totally an option. And then if you want more information, that's more long form on shark behavior. Um, I, one of my bosses, Ocean Ramsey, she does have a book called um, What You Should Know About Sharks. And that goes more information on nice. shark behavior and stuff. So it's, it's really broken down for people that have never seen sharks before. So mm. definitely a lot of information in that as well. So a lot of resources, a lot of stuff you can see all of us are really active on social media. So that's definitely a great place to start for nice. that kind of stuff. Great. And we'll network all of that. And then when we finally get a chance, we'll, uh, we're, we're not diving with anybody, but you, if you can uh, guarantee that. When <laughs> yeah. we come we're going to do one heck of a shark dive. I'm already excited. Great, great conversation. Yes. Yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta come out. Well, now Hawaii is allowing travelers as long as you have a negative COVID test. So it's even yep. easier. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Well, our, uh, uh, one of my mentors and the, one of our retired chiefs, the last chief that helped me form up our special operations team, Mike Carrion, is now relocated to the Big Island permanently oh, um, nice. from being inland here. And he comes and visits the States. But, it, you know, it's one of those things when you're coming over, we got all these <laughs> snorkeling spots, all these dive spots, and yeah. we got another thing to do. Yeah. It's a little more intense. Island right? hopping. Yeah. yeah. Do I, think I'm gonna, I think we're going to have to rope the, the chief and his family into a shark dive with you, too. And, <laughs> I just hope you're ready for about 10 of us. <laughs> well, you can get, we do have like, you can just get a private charter and then just have, I think we do a maximum of 12 on the big boat now. So you can just get a private charter and then, yeah. Very cool. That Very sounds cool. awesome. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so great much. Great stuff. And um, it, it's good to finally meet you in person. And thanks so much for sharing what you've shared today. Um, mm. There's probably going to be some follow-up questions and, you know, we're certainly going to, tag you when we drop this podcast and everybody's Instagram handles. And one cool thing about the Thin Green Line podcast and our Warden's Watch podcast that's been so neat is people not necessarily with the three of our backgrounds in conservation as a, as a profession have just thrived into the message and they thrived into wanting to be involved. And so from live Q and A's Wayne and I are doing and different things we're doing for the show, I'm bringing people that just love the outdoors, but have never really experienced wildlife. Right. And uh, that's, yeah. that's the best audience, you know, it's not our, our little niche. Um, so it's been really neat to educate there and have them spread the word and make those changes, you know, um, kind of from the ground up. So we'll share all of that and uh, you might get a few, few questions or even more than that. So. Yeah, yourself. no, I appreciate it. Send them my way, get all awesome. the answers taken care of for that. Um, but I, I love that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, Thank you so much. It was a great conversation, a uh, great enlightenment. Uh, and that, that, what's the shark above your head? Because I always like to talk about the backgrounds because I'm always interested in what, 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 what creates okay. people. Look at that. So uh, that, this is awesome. Yeah. This is the shark background. <laughs> Not uh, and then my surfboard, like just like. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, so Excellent. <laughs> we didn't even talk about surfing. Much better at diving <laughs> underwater than surfing, but yeah. yeah. Imagine. Well, when you live in Hawaii, you got to have a surfboard, right? Yeah, even if you suck at it. Yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> awesome. Yeah. Even if you try to launch it, yeah. Just drowning the whole time is fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, thanks so much. And we'll, we'll be here for questions and follow up. And uh, great to have you on. And uh, keep doing what you're doing and stay safe. And uh, kudos to you and your crew. Thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you, Andrew.